Hey everyone, I'm Michael, and today I'm going to be building a home NAS server. So that's network attached storage. So that's a file server that I can run on my network and store a lot of my data there. So for the past eight years, I've been running a Synology DS412 Plus, and I really like it. It's one of the best products I've ever bought, seriously. But it's running out of space, it's getting a little bit older. And as much as I love Synology, I'd like to switch to something open source with open standards. So that's why I'm interested in TrueNAS, which uses ZFS. So I think that's gonna be kind of a, a cool transition. So I'm gonna just show you the components that I'm using in my build. So I'll start with the case. So here we got the Fractal Node 304. The last server I bought was a Fractal, or the last case I, I used was a Fractal. I really like the case. The Fractal has a lot of nice little convenience features that, that keep it keep everything organized and make it very convenient and tidy to build servers. So I, I decided to stick with the Fractal. It has space for six three and a half inch drives. Uh, I'm gonna start with only four, but it's good to have some room for expansion. And it it should be like a pretty small form factor. I tried to go for something that's pretty close to what the Synology looks like. Uh, the Synology is kind of a, a cube shape and I, I like that it fits on the desk where I keep it. So that was part of the inspiration there. I spent, it was $100 for this case, so not too bad. Next is the motherboard. So motherboard is the Asus Prime I3, A320iK. And there are a few reasons I chose this motherboard. So I like AMD, so I was gonna stick with an AMD compatible motherboard. Also, this is the first time I'm building uh, mini ITX system and look how cute it is. It's it's called a motherboard. It should be called a little baby board. It's it's an adorable little little board. I've never used a motherboard this small. I'm excited. I'm kind of worried that it's going to be so small that just manipulating the components is going to be difficult, but like too crowded, but we'll see. Another reason I chose this one is that it supports onboard video. So with a, a mini ITX you're pretty limited in terms of the ports you have. So it's got one PCI E slot here. And so if I got a motherboard that didn't have integrated graphics, then I would have to use up that PCI E slot for the graphics card. Um, this, this gives me the flexibility that I don't have to use a PCI E slot to get graphics because it's built into the, the motherboard as long as I get a compatible CPU. It's got two, two slots for RAM. Um, that's good enough for me. It supports M2, which I really like uh, in terms of the SSD standard. It has HDMI out. So all in all, like everything that I, I like, it's got four SATA ports. So that works for me because I want to start with four SATA drives. Um, it's possible for me to, to upgrade in the future with uh, a host bus adapter, an HBA. I actually decided against the HBA for this build. Um, I, can always, I can always add it later because I've got that PCIe slot free. I've seen reports that the HBA is, um, so people use it to expand the number of disks they can connect, but a lot of people are doing that to connect like 20 disks. I'm good with four for now. Um, it's got, the case has got space for six, so I can upgrade if I need to, and I can add that HBA. But I decided to skip because the motherboard has enough ports and because everything I've read about setting up an HBA seems like a huge hassle, so, um, Let's, I'm gonna take my chances to see how the performance is without the HBA, and then I can add one later if I need to. Next is the CPU. So it's the AMD Athlon 3000G. And as I mentioned, this, this CPU supports integrated graphics. Um, it's got support for Radeon, so I don't need a separate GPU. This is partially inspired by Brian Moses. Brian Moses in his last uh, Econo NAS build, his low-end NAS, he used one of these. And it seems to be working out well for him. Um, actually, that's one he didn't, he only built in theory. So it's theoretically still working out for him. But I like, uh, in terms of, of price and performance, it's not a super powerful CPU in terms of like CPU benchmark. I think if it clocks in at like 4,500 on the CPU benchmark. Um, but from what I've read about TrueNAS, you don't need a ton of CPU power. So I'm hoping I can get by with that. This this is $105 for that CPU. So I think that's a pretty good price. Next is the OS drive. So got a Kingston A400. This was $34, 120 gigabyte M2 drive. Like, can you imagine $34? That's that's a great deal. I, 
I don't care too much about the OS drive. I didn't look too much into like benchmarks of how fast reads and writes are for the A400. Um, from my experiments, the the OS drive on the TrueNAS build and, and also with the Synology, it doesn't seem to have a ton of, of reads and writes to the OS drive. You're, you're mostly reading and writing to the data drive. So that's where I, I focused. So that brings us to the data drive. So I got a variety of drives. So I got two of the, whoops, I can't do this in reverse, uh, the Toshiba N300s. So I saw reports from a few people that they were using this for true NAS or other kinds of NAS and people seemed uh, pretty happy with them. So it's each one is eight terabytes. So it's, it's going to be a four by eight system because with ZFS, you can't mix the size of your drive. So I made sure to, to get um, identically sized drives. But I bought them from two different vendors. So I bought one from Amazon and I bought the other from Newegg. And the reason for that is you want to minimize the chances that your drives came from the same manufacturing batch. Because with a NAS, you've got redundancy, so you're safe in case one drive dies, you can replace it and rebuild the, the ZFS pool. But the problem is if you get them from the same manufacturing batch, it's a lot more likely that the drives are gonna die at the same time because they came from the same batch, you're running them the this same number of write and read cycles roughly, you have this them running for the same length of time. So unlike just taking four random drives, if you got them from the same manufacturing batch, it's a lot more likely they'll all die at the same time. So I got uh, two different types of drives uh, and bought each from a different vendor. So the other type was a Seagate uh, Iron Wolf NAS. I didn't go for the Iron Wolf Pro. Um, it was it was like a significant price difference to go up to Pro. And from what I've read, there wasn't a huge difference. It's like the the rating was for, I think it was like 300,000 write cycles versus 500,000. I don't care that much. I don't do, this is just for home use. I don't do, I'm not doing like constant reads and writes to the disks the same way I would if I was running a data center or something. So the one from Newegg actually came in like very minimal, like almost OEM packaging. And then the one I bought from Amazon came in like a normal retail package. One thing that's important when you're choosing your hard drives is to make sure you're not buying drives that are based on SMR technology. So that's shingled magnetic recording. For whatever reason, SMR performs poorly on ZFS. So you want to make sure the drive you're buying doesn't use SMR. CMR is safe. And if you look at the TrueNAS website, they have a list of known SMR drives. And so you can usually, usually find, confirm that before you buy that the ones that you're buying are using CMR or some other technology that's compatible with ZFS. Next is the RAM. So I got Corsair Vengeance LPX. This is two by, oops, two by 16 gig. So it's 32 gigs of total RAM. And last is the PSU. So I got the EVGA 500 BQ. PSUs are kind of boring to, to pick out. There's there's not a lot of, you're not gonna like find a benchmark for your PSU. So that's all, and now I'm ready to build. Okay, so after some hiccups, we've got the build completed. So I don't have a great setup for showing it, but it looks like here's the completed build. See, these are these uh, the hard drives on top. And you got the little mini ITX motherboard in there, and it's all wired up and ready to go but you'll notice i don't have a keyboard and monitor set up for it yet uh, so instead i'm going to use the tiny pilot voyager 2 which is a product i designed for exactly this purpose so to start out i'm going to plug in ethernet cable and so voyager 2 is powered through PoE, so it's, it's on now just from the ethernet. And it's got an HDMI capture. So I'm gonna plug this into the HDMI output of the NAS server. And then it's got a data cable that's just um, USB-A. And so I'm just gonna plug that into a USB-A cable on the server. And that is gonna give me a web interface and so I'm gonna pull that up to start. Let's just load the web interface. So it's got no signal because that's what we expect because 
We haven't actually turned on the server yet. So let's hit the power button and see what happens. Okay, so we've got the server booting. So hopefully we pick up a signal from, and there we go. We're seeing the ASUS boot. Cool, so I'm gonna try booting into BIOS by hitting delete. And it's gonna take a little bit to boot up, but I can, I can control it with the tiny pilot before it's booted, because I've got physical control. And there we go. So we're into BIOS. And we can explore here. It's a little bit small screen for the capture, but we can do whatever we want in BIOS. Um, so I'm gonna exit out of this, and I'm gonna get the server out of the way of my keyboard and mouse, and I'm gonna show you how to install TrueNAS. And it's gonna be interesting for me because it's I'm not a TrueNAS expert, so we'll see how it goes. All right, now that the server is out of the way, I'm ready to install TrueNAS. So I'm just gonna install TrueNAS on the server. So to start, I'm gonna grab the install disk for TrueNAS. And I really just wanna grab the URL here because I can upload that to the tiny pilot. Okay, so now I'm downloading the TrueNAS ISO to the tiny pilot and once we get it downloaded it can the tiny pilot can mount the iso file as a virtual disk on the server so it's going to look to the server as if the there was a usb flash drive inserted with the true nas iso uh, mounted on it so that's a pretty convenient feature okay so that's done now i can mount it that's mounted, and from here, I'm just gonna turn the computer on again and boot into that drive. It's gonna take a second to boot up. Here we go. So delete, I'm hoping you get me BIOS or boot options. Okay, so we're in BIOS. And I can change the boot priority. Can I just boot one time here? Hmm. Let's just try, oops. Okay, it was showing us. Oh, now I'm, let's say tiny pilot is the first boot option. And then we'll exit and save out of here. But I have made changes. What? What? Change this to the first boot. So let's see if that does anything. All right. So the BIOS seems confused, but hopefully we boot into the tiny pilot. There we go, so FreeBSD, and so we want to boot the TrueNAS installer, and there we go. So we're booting that right off of the TinyPod's virtual disk. We want install, and we don't want to install on any of our eight terabyte drives, we want to install on the M2, so that's this. So we'll erase all petitions, yeah, let's go. And uh, I can do no password. Um, for the sake of demonstration, let's just say password is the password. Uh, pretty new hardware, so let's try UEFI. Why not? Let's go for a swap. So swap is just where the OS writes memory when it runs out of RAM. We got 32 gigs of RAM, so we shouldn't run out of RAM, but I don't think we're gonna need 128 gigs of space for the OS drive. All right, so it looks like it's done. Let's reboot and do as it says. So 
I'm gonna reboot and then there we go. And I'm gonna unmount. That was a pretty fast install. Of course, I was sped up for you, but in a couple minutes. Okay, so now we're booted up. We've got the web interface. It's showing us that the web interface is running. It's giving us the IP address, but we can actually just go to truenas.local. And it's warning us that it doesn't recognize the certificate, but we expect that because it just generated it. And the super secure credentials of root and password. So, okay, so it telling us to get started. So this is the thing I don't love about TrueNAS is that it doesn't give you a ton of help when you first start. Um, it doesn't make it very clear what you need to do. But we've got this dashboard. Um, and so what we actually want to do is go to storage and pools. So we've got no pools. So we want to create our first ZFS pool. And so we want to do create a new pool. All my eight terabyte hard drives. And by default, it's going to do RAID Z2, which is more redundancy than I need. I don't expect to lose more than one drive at a time, so fingers crossed on that. But RAID Z1 gives me a little bit more capacity. So we can see with RAID Z1, it gives me about 22 terabytes. RAID Z2 is 16. It's like a pretty bad yield. It's, it's spending half of my disk space on redundancy. With RAID Z1, it's a little bit more. So, and we're just gonna call it pool one. I don't have a more creative name. I'm not going to turn on encryption for the pool. I'm going to decide that on a data set. Uh, so that within pools, you can have data sets. So I'm going to encrypt the data sets, but not the entire pool. So let's create this. Yep. OK, and there we go. Let's create the pool. So that was pretty fast. So it created the pool. So next, uh, what I want is a data set. So add data set. And let's call this data set text files. So this is just kind of a demonstration. And for this one, I actually do want to turn on encryption. And so I'm going to encrypt with a passphrase. And let's go with our classic password of password. Of course, for my real data, I'm going to use a stronger password. But just for fun, for a demonstration, I'm going to use password. So I set that up. And so we've got this text files data set. And so I should be able to share this. So I pop over to Windows Shares. So I'm, I run a Windows system on my main dev box. And so I want to share the text files data set. Um, and I don't know that I want the default. I do want the default share. And I also want to allow guest access. Normally, I would protect this with something more restrictive, but just for demonstration to get something up fast. I'm going to show you uh, guest access. So here we go. SMB service has been, and so it's asking me to configure an ACL. Not sure why, because I enabled guest access. And for fun, I'm going to say this is also uh, an open ACL. Um, again, this is just for, for demonstration. And let's save this. Okay, so if that worked, I should be able to access the data set from, there we go, and we've got text files. And let's just create a new text document called hello. So I'm saying hello world, which you can't see because this is but let's just zoom in on that. Okay, so I'm writing hello world in this text file. And unfortunately, the TrueNAS web GUI, whoops, doesn't have a file explorer. But what we do have, we can pop back over into TinyPilot because we've got a shell here. So nine is to configure a shell. And I can go into mount. What do we call it? Pool one. 
and then we see text files and then so there we go we got hello world uh, freebsd is confused a little bit by the windows line endings but there we have it so that's pretty cool so i was able to set up TrueNAS and share it with my windows dev box so i'm gonna be playing with this a little bit more but i'm pretty happy with the start here okay hope you enjoyed <laughs>